So what about improving performance? So we've done a lot with RAID and with the checksums in ZFS to improve robustness and integrity. What about performance? How do we make it take less time to read files from a disk? Good. Yeah, so we can do a lot of things in where we place things. If we're very smart about how we place things, maybe we don't have to do long seeks. Maybe what we're looking for is going to be under the disk head when we need it. That's really an operating system issue, right? To figure out where things go on the disk, at least with the kinds of file systems we've been talking about, it's up to the operating system to figure out the next disk block to use. So figuring out where to put things. What are other things we can do to make things faster? And this is one that works in almost all computing systems, and we definitely talked about it with web servers. Yes. OK. So that was not the one I was thinking about. That's a good one, right? So we could parallelize. We could have multiple heads. So the first way to have multiple heads, you can't really see this in the picture, right? There's not just one disk with stuff on it. There's, there's many, probably four or seven layers there. But you could have more than one read head. If you have more than one read head, where do you want the other one? You want it near this one or somewhere else? Probably want it 180 degrees around the circle from this one. Right? You probably want it over here. So that way, the longest seek time is just half a rotation instead of a full rotation. Okay. I don't know if any disks are designed that way, but there probably are some. The head is a fairly expensive part of the disk, and this would lead to a lot of complexity. So I'm not sure that there are disks designed this way, but it seems like a good idea. There's a, another thing. So I guess you've probably heard the healthcare.gov went down again. Given how positive I was talking about it, that's a little sad. Now, that part of the reason I was so positive talking about it was when it was first going down, I was quoted in the media saying, it was hopeless and they should throw it out and start from scratch. So I felt like I had to redeem myself by saying how they fixed it and that they were able to fix it. And I guess maybe they should have still started from scratch, which is what I thought initially. But what was the main thing they did to make healthcare.gov at least work better in January than it did in November? Yeah, caching was the main thing. All modern disks have a cache. And we can throw a little bit of RAM on our disk. RAM is very inexpensive. We're going to have much better performance if we have a cache. This gets into sud sort of tough questions about where do you want to do things. Do you want to do this in the application, in the kernel, or in the hardware? When you did caching in problem set three, you were doing caching in your server at the application. This was running in user space at the application layer. You were running on top of a kernel that was also doing caching. And you were running that on top of hardware, a disk drive that had its own cache. So you've got at least three different places where files that you read from the disk might have been cached. This seems like a really bad property for a design to have, right? To have all these different caches of different layers, the ones that know the most about different things are sort of where they are. So the cache on the disk doesn't know anything about your application, but it knows at a very direct level what blocks are being read. The cache in your application doesn't know anything about how things are stored on the disk but it knows about the kinds of things your web server is doing. So that at least somewhat justifies having all these different caches in different places. It seems like if you looked at the whole system, it would make much more sense to have one cache in one place. The kind of cache that most disks have is what's called an adaptive replacement cache, although people use different names for marketing and other reasons. This is the one we'll talk about. So it's a really simple idea. So we're going to keep track in the cache of recently accessed blocks. And we're going to have two parts to the cache. There's going to be one part that is recent entries. And that's going to be just first most recently used. And then we're going to have another part of it that is ones that are used frequently. So the way you get into the frequently used cache is if you are already in the recently used cache and you're accessed again while you're still in the recently used cache, then you get promoted to the frequently used cache. Why it's adaptive is the sizes of these two things vary. Instead of saying, we're going to do a lot of simulations and figure out the correct size of each of these caches for the amount of memory you have, the way the adaptive replacement cache works is this is variable. So there's something that keeps track of where the divide is, and that varies. And in addition to the actual blocks that we store, there's a table that keeps track of the blocks that are not there. So for these entries, you're actually storing these things in the cache. You're storing that whole block in there 
for what's in the ghost entries, you're just storing this disk block used to be in the cache, but it's not there anymore. So if you hit there, you still have to go to the disk to get it, but you're using these to help adjust the size. How should we decide when to increase the size of T1? T1 is our recent cache entries. That's just a rolling buffer of all the blocks on the disk that have been accessed most recently. So what would be a sign that we want to increase that? Let's see. So what does it mean if we get a hit? Let's say we get a hit here. So there's a request for a disk block, and it was in this V2 buffer, which means it was recently evicted from the frequently used blocks area. What would cause that? Yeah. Yeah, so certainly when we move something in, if we move this one in, what was here before is done. So we had to pick some slot in this fixed size cache to replace what was there with this new thing. Right? We decided we want to keep a new thing in this frequently used cache. This could also be, be based on, on least recently used from this group, or there could be some other replacement algorithm, but usually least recently used. That suggests we want more things, right? If we just remove something from that cache, but we actually read it again, that suggests we should keep more space available for the frequently used blocks. Whereas if we get a hit here, well, that says we're not waiting long enough, that there are blocks that we're using and reusing, but they're getting removed from the cache before we use them again. So that would suggest if we get a hit here, we want to increase the size of T1, if we get a hit here, we want to increase the size of T2. So that's exactly what an adaptive replacement cache does. Based on the hits to these ghost caches, actually I shouldn't call them ghost caches, the ghost entries. They're not caches because the data's not there anymore. But we're keeping track of how well the cache did dynamically and adjusting these sizes as they go. That's what the adaptive replacement cache does. And this works surprisingly well for most workloads. The types of workloads that have lots of frequently used blocks, the disk will learn that pretty quickly and move the size up. The types of workloads that have lots of blocks that are accessed a few times in short order, but then not accessed again, the disk will learn that it's this kind of load and move up. And maybe at the application level or maybe in the operating system it's really clever, it could figure that out. Turns out that figuring that out at the disk level is a lot easier and the simple strategy works, works very well. And the reason it's called ARC, is it was invented at Almaden Research Center, which is a place in the middle of a park in San Jose that I interned at when I was an undergrad, not working on anything related to this. They don't actually admit that they use their acronym, but that's probably why they called it this. The other issue with it is it is patented. Lots of open source operating systems implemented something sort of like this and then either got scared because of the patent and tweaked it in ways that made it a little worse or did something different. So that's the main drawback to ARC is the patent, which is a fairly recent patent that I don't think has ever been brought in a challenge, but scares people from using it. <laughs>